Good evening to everyone. I don't know if you all respond. Good evening. Very nice. My name is Amy Rogers, and I'm just privileged to be here tonight. I am the teaching leader overseeing the Windermere class. We are a day women's class, and we meet on Tuesday mornings. So we support each other's classes. If anyone's absent and needs a lecture, needs some help, we're just happy to help each other. So Vanya is a sweet friend. I love her dearly, and I'm just glad I can be here to see what she sees, all of you, which is such a blessing in this church. So thanks for having me. And I've just got a few announcements that have been given to me. Tonight, we're going to have a combined group. Joy's group is going to combine with Amy in room 233, and Kristen is doing the same. So Joy and Kristen's groups will be with Amy in room 233. The second announcement is that the we're having a mini study come up. It's a three week mini study. So you can invite any friend to come with you. And it's covering Lamentations and Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a two week study. So the mini study is three weeks in total. But if there's someone who's been on your heart and you've thought she should check out BSF, this is our last mini study for the year. So now's your chance to invite her. And then lastly, um, all of you already know that next year's study is the book of John. And the, it's beginning September 11th for your class. And John's registration will open soon. So if you've wondered, should I do something? Just hold tight. It's coming. And you'll be able to register soon for next year's study of John. Thank you, Amy. Hi, everyone. Greetings from the BSF program, uh, the student program. Does anyone remember the new vision statement for the student program? I gave you a cheat sheet just in case you didn't. We changed our vision statement this year, and let's read it together. We believe that a student's active engagement in God's word produces personal, passionate commitment to God's truth. So how do we do that in lesson 23? Well, I tell you, we have six lessons remaining for the students. They're one less than the adult lessons. So we need your help, BSF adults, to help us finish strong, to honor God with doing our very best. The CLs will be encouraging your students to spend time in their discovery guides, um, answering the questions, doing the family-friendly activities provided in their guides to punctuate what they're learning and how they can live differently because of it. So you're probably wondering, how do I find these discovery student guides? Well, there are two ways to access them. First, they're on your main lessons page, kind of gave you a little picture of it, um, where you would normally find downloading your lesson, watching the video for the lecture, or even if you like to listen to the notes, I like to listen to the notes. Um, there is a, a gray box that says student discovery guides, and they're gauged for ages. So those in the lower elementary are ages five to seven, upper elementary are ages nine to 10, middle school and high school. You can print them out all at once or you can download them to your device. The other way also to um, find them is through your resource library tab. And you can just enter 20-29, that stands for lessons 20 through 29, and then use the drop down box and click study resources. That'll give you all of those lessons. Um, and on your last page of each lesson, you'll find a take part with two options that are age appropriate for your students. In lower elementary for next um, week's lesson, they're asking them uh, to walk around the neighborhood with your family or BSF adult and talk about the warriors who protect and keep you safe. Or option two is desired God desired to clean the city, help with cleaning the job around your house or your yard. Think about what it looked like before and after and what good came from your cleaning. So those are activities that everybody can kind of learn to live differently by studying God's word. High school levels are a little different. Their activities will be about the truths about Nahum and Zephaniah and 
um, what their meaning may be to someone in BSF. We have a global ministry. You may have relatives on the other side of the country studying the same lesson this week. So have them reach out to their um, someone studying this and ask them, why is it important to them? What meaning did they get from that? The other option would be that Zephaniah describes God rejoicing over his people. And how could they rejoice over someone that next week? Whether it's sending them a note of encouragement or writing them a song or a poem. BSF adults, please make sure your students have access to these resources and have a Bible when they come and bring it to class each week. Hard copies and digital formats will work. However, if your student is easily just distracted with their device, you may have to have that little talk with them about no gaming, no texting, no scrolling, just their Bible app and their questions. So if you can help us out with that, we would appreciate it. And thank you so much. And remember, we want to finish well because we want to produce personal, passionate commitment to God's word, to God's truth for the students. have a piano player on Tuesday so that was beautiful let us open us let me open us up with a word of prayer Lord we just give you tonight we ask that you would just be present we invite you into this sanctuary just asking that you would come to work on our hearts and that we would sit with open hearts for you that we would come with an attitude of humility knowing that you know best and you know what is best for us. So help us to be transformed within so that we can be changed outside. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you again. Can you take yourself back to the playgrounds of your childhood and remember playing on a teeter-totter? Did you ever suddenly jump off while you were at the bottom and watch the other person crash to the ground? You do not need to raise your hand. You can stay quiet. Or 
Did you ever push down hard and suddenly, and then grab your end so the board would slap the other person? Again, you can stay quiet. Or how about just sitting on the bottom, if you were heavier, and leaving the lighter one just hanging up there in the air. Many of us were playground villains as often as we were victims, but we wouldn't play that way as adults, or would we? Are there times when we still leave people hanging in the air at our mercy? Are there still times when we throw our weight around just a little bit? The whole idea behind the teeter-totter is balance. And that's also the idea behind the game of life. Jesus came to restore balance. He calls us to do the very same. We're called to gracefully lift each other up and then gently let each other down. That's the way God designed the teeter-totter and he designed life to work that way as well. Relationships, they matter greatly to God. How we treat one another matters greatly to God. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other. Love one another as I have loved you. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord. And then finally, gracious words are a honeycomb, a sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Scripture is full of God's wisdom on how we should interact with those around us. The prophet Micah had much to share with God's people about this very thing as well. Micah's sermons contained within seven short chapters and delivered to the southern kingdom of Judah. They describe Israel's transgressions as fraud, theft, greed, debauchery, oppression, hypocrisy, heresy, injustice, extortion, along with lying, murder, and more offenses against the Lord. The list seemed endless. And Micah's message was so clear. God's judgment was on its way. Verse 1 of chapter 1 clearly offers the time frame of Micah's ministry during the reign of the Judean kings Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. So his message was brought to God's people prior to being exiled. As a contemporary to the prophets Isaiah, Hosea, and Amos, Micah's audience was in a prosperous time. Yet amidst their external prosperity, they were experiencing spiritual decay within. There were a multitude of false prophets during this time. And chapter 3, verses 5 to 7, describes those false prophets as self-seeking, leading people astray by spe speaking messages that the people wanted to hear, not messages that they needed to hear. While in contrast, Micah's message was different as he was wholly devoted to the Lord and walked in obedience to God's call upon his life, boldly speaking hard truths from the Lord. Micah's message to God's people can be broken down into two divisions. Division one is titled Injustice and Judgment and covers chapters one, two, and three. As capital cities are often the center of governing decision-making and sort of where the pace of the rest of the country is set, Samaria and Jerusalem are Micah's main audiences as he addresses their sins against God. Although God had already begun his judgment upon Samaria in Micah's ministry, he uses Samaria's future fate as an example to the people of Judah, as a warning so they won't follow in the same way as their northern neighbor. 
their sins of idolatry, lack of trust in God to provide, and injustice toward others were so prevalent in Judah's capital city. And because of these cities' great influence, these sins from Judah were infiltrating the entire country as well. Trusting God completely and seeing all people as his image bearers and his workmanship, that's God's longing for his society, for ours today. Knowing that Micah witnessed the fall of Israel, it helps us to better understand that his message to them came with a deep emotional connection to their plight. Micah shepherded these very people. He walked life with them. So his heart longs for them to avoid the judgment that will come to them if they don't turn back to God. If we look back for a minute, don't have to turn there, but to the book of Exodus, the Mosaic law was given to the nation of Israel through the prophet Moses. It was a conditional covenant God made with his people. In establishing the Mosaic covenant with Israel, once again, the terms of the relationship were set. This time, the terms are different. If you remember back in Genesis, when God made his covenant with Abraham, the terms were quite gracious and unconditional. Abraham simply had to believe. Now God says, having saved you as my people, I want you to live like my people. I want you to live in such a way that people can tell you are mine and that you will bring glory to my name. So he lays out the Ten Commandments. Those are the terms of his covenant. Now here, if we go back to our passage, during the times of the divided kingdom, Micah is pointing out through God's message that the people of Judah are not upholding these commandments. The Lord wants their lives. He wants their very heart to demonstrate in all that they do that they belong to him and to him alone. Instead, their sins abound and their lives, they aren't reflecting who he is. Chapter two summarizes their mistreatment toward people, plundering of the poor, scheming human plans that harm others but profited themselves along with false prophecies that were given to the people simply to please them. And then these false prophets would benefit from delivering the good news the people wanted to hear. In chapter two, verse six, these false prophets shout out to godly prophets. And this is what they said. Don't prophesy about these things. Disgrace, it won't overtake us. They were working against the word of the Lord. And yet their message, sounding more positive, more encouraging, that was the message that the people wanted to receive. That's the one they paid more attention to. These false prophets, they carried out poor leadership. And as the leadership goes, so goes the people. God's people were listening to their words above the words spoken by God himself through his prophets. The godly prophet is described in 3 verse 8. Micah is filled by power with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression, to Israel his sin. We have to recognize at this moment that even when Israel was steeped in sin, God still pursues them. He sends his messenger Micah with a powerful message, not only of judgment coming, but the hope he has in store for those who wait upon the Lord. If we look back at chapter one, verse eight, we see how Micah personally responds to this message. He's been called to deliver to God's people. It says this, because of this, Micah says, I will weep, I will go about barefoot and naked, I will howl like a jackal and moan like an owl. 
for Samaria's plague is incurable. It has spread to Judah. It has reached the very gate of my people, even to Jerusalem itself. Even though Micah himself has not participated in the very sins God is addressing with them, he grieves the state of their hearts and he mourns how they stand before God. His message invites them to mourn as well. He longs for their posture before God to be that of a humble and repentant heart. So let's take a breath here. It's a little heavy on the sin side, right? Let's ask ourselves, why does all of this matter to you and me today, tonight? Throughout our passage, God's people, they weren't doing what he commanded them to do. They weren't lending their ears or their hearts toward him in order to recognize their fallen ways. How does this apply to us, to you and me? If you are sitting here tonight or watching online and you've entrusted your life to Jesus Christ as your savior, then you too are being called to live in the same way that God called his people long ago. The principle here is injustice displeases the Lord. Injustice displeases the Lord. We too are called to stand as witnesses of God's love for all people. We're called to see people through the lens of Jesus's love his heart for them, and we're called to represent Christ with justice and mercy. We should be the hands and feet of Christ, helping to provide for those who are in, in need and to love others well. We should be willing to step out beyond our own community to see those less fortunate or different than ourselves and act with great care and concern for them. And likewise, just as Micah was willing to stand firm in speaking hard truths to God's people, we too are being called to stand firm on biblical truths, even when our culture and people close to us fight against it. Are you willing to speak up with gentle words of confident truth when the Spirit leads you to speak for Him? Gentle words of confident truth. That's key, isn't it? To love while we speak. When you cross paths with, with people during your everyday lives, are you quick to give words of grace, words of understanding? And if you're sitting with us and you haven't put your trust in Jesus Christ yet, God is calling you to live out these same biblical truths for his name's sake. Do the kindness, do the loving for him, to represent him. Surrendering our agenda, which is our desires, our irritations, our inconveniences, surrendering all of that for his higher ways of patience, grace, and forgiveness, it will result in his purpose being lived out in our lives. To live out our lives with his kingdom perspective means that we take part in being Christ's presence in the midst of a sinful world. The truth is that God cares about how his creation, including you and me, how his creation is treated, and he expects you and me to be among the first to extend justice, mercy, and love lavishly with a generous heart. We have chance after chance to show Christ to people on a daily basis. Abiding close to the Lord will help us do this well for God. Our second division is titled Repentance and Restoration, and it will cover chapters four, five, six, and seven. Throughout this short book of Micah, his message to God's people follows a pattern of pending judgment, followed by the promise of great hope. Each of his three messages begins with the word here, sort of like with an exclamation point. Here, 
listen up. Found at the onset of chapter one, then again it's in chapter three, verse nine, and finally we see the word here in chapter six, verse two. Micah is calling God's people to hear the warning, to take heed to what God is seeing in their lives and to direct their hearts back to him. In this second half of Micah, the hope he offers was received by God's people as a promise to save them from their enemies. They were looking for him to provide peace in their land, in their current day. Come now, come quickly. That was kind of their message. And I raised my hand, so now I have to find my place, sorry. To be delivered from the Assyrians would be the initial longing for Samaria, and eventually we know that Jerusalem too would seek God's deliverance from the Babylonians. Again, God's people were seeking physical deliverance and restoration alone. Micah's message brings a greater depth to the meaning behind God coming to restore his people. Chapter four describes the ultimate peace that will be brought to all who believe in the name of the Lord when God returns to reign supreme over the earth. Micah tells them that God's temple will be the central focus, his teachings will prevail, and that everyone will encounter safety and peace. There will be spiritual unity, as Micah describes that we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. We will walk in the name of the Lord. It's unifying. And most importantly, Micah points out God's people, points God's people's attention toward the promised ruler from Bethlehem, the Messiah. Micah specifically announces that this Messiah will be the next rightful king from David's line. And chapter five, verse four states that this ruler will stand and shepherd the flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and the people will live securely for then his goodness will reach to the ends of the earth. Chapter five, verse five really stood out to me this week when we look at our world and then we read this. He will be our peace. In the New Testament passage of John 14, 27, Jesus proclaims his promise to be our peace as he assures the disciples, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I don't give as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. As readers of our time, we have the benefit of getting to read Old Testament with the New Testament scriptures as well. And reading them side by side assures us once again that the Bible is one story telling of God's great love for his people and the fulfillment of his plans for all of his creation. And his plan, it includes you and me. Chapter five, and then again in chapter six, Micah identifies the remnant which God had promised to his people. The word remnant means a leftover amount from a bigger portion or a bigger piece. It comes from the French word ramenant, which means to remain. I loved that. The remnant remains. This remnant it isn't just a bunch of leftovers who survived difficulty and just happened to be standing at the end of the battle, or they haven't just happened to skirt judgment or the test of time. This concept of a remnant here in scripture is unique. The Lord, he is gonna advance his plans with this remnant as his foundation. It matters to him. This remnant is special. 4 verse 12 strongly announces that the enemies of Israel, they don't know the thoughts or plans of the Lord. They don't understand his plan. God encourages his people saying, rise, 
thrash daughter of Zion, for I will give you horns of iron and I will give you the hooves of bronze. He's not looking to the remnant to just figure it out. He's swooping in, he is coming. The remnant are those who stand firm in their trust in the Lord. They don't waver and they do not question his ways, but they keep their eyes fixed upon him, ready for his call, ready to obey. You and I, we are invited to be a part of that remnant. God's remnant, those who have been repentant and faithful to God, they're gonna be like a lion. This scripture said, dominant and powerful because of him, right? God is essentially telling his people, I've got you, let go and let God. Have you heard that? He's literally saying, let go of your agenda. Let go of what's so important to you and let me be your first love. Let me be who you seek very first. He says, I have a plan that thwarts all others and my plan is unstoppable. Join me or be left behind. His message is the same today. This remnant God speaks of with Christ as its ruler will conquer the world. They will stand firm against enemies. They will represent God himself. So in the midst of the Israelites mess and in the midst of our messy lives here today, in this world that seems to have so little evidence of love for God, we are offered this hope so that we too will look ahead, keep our eyes fixed on God and his plans for the future, and we won't allow today's world and its circumstances to cloud our clear vision of who God is and what he is doing in our midst. What Micah has described here, it's a real place. It's a real time that will exist when Jesus returns for the second time. The doctrine that's threaded just beautifully through our passage, through the book of Micah, this week is the second coming of Christ. Old Testament prophets foretold the first coming of Christ when he would offer himself as a sacrifice for sin. This first coming was not to judge people, but to show them the way. The prophets also foretold his second coming, when he would come again to reign and rule on earth before mankind's final judgment. Our lives certainly look different when we don't believe that Jesus is coming again to take back this world and to reign as an almighty king. If we don't believe that Jesus will come again, God seems somewhat disconnected to our lives here in this modern world. History seems to be on this strange trajectory that may seem meaningless or without purpose or direction. What are we really even doing here? Might be a question if you don't believe. The sin and the troubles in this world seem to have no resolution no end in sight. We can become overwhelmed if we don't believe, overwhelmed by our circumstances and the challenges that this world presents as if we're navigating it all on our own, like in a pinball machine, just being rocked around. When we don't believe that he will return, we live like what's described in chapter six, like God has almost done something to us. We live like God has burdened us. But in our passage, God reminds his people of his faithfulness to bring them out of Egypt, to provide good leadership, to guide them to follow him. We too are continually being saved by God. He is continually offering his son Jesus to you and me so that we too can be freed from the bondage of sin. How are we responding to his offer of that kind of hope? 
But when we live in anticipation and belief that Jesus will return again to earth, then we know without a doubt that God has an unstoppable, undeniable plan. No matter how discouraging, how desperate this world seems, as God's children, we would know with certainty that Jesus will come to deliver lasting hope and victory that this world will never be able to offer. Circumstances in our lives can look so bleak, so discouraging, so disheartening, yet we know God wins this battle against sin. We know he is victorious. So we live today preparing for Jesus to return. We begin today to heed his biblical warnings and we desire to stay in step with his ways. In our leadership meeting, we were talking about humility. What does that look like? And one of our leaders said, I pictured it like my six-year-old who says, I am walking with you, but she's many steps ahead. Or I am coming, but she's several steps behind. God is asking us to be right by his side so that the, the traffic comes, he's there. If something's coming from behind, he's there. The Bible, it's God's manual for living the kind of life he longs for us to live. Six verse eight is a beautiful message from God to our hearts today. He has shown you, O oh, oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you and me to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? Are we known for justice and mercy for all or just for some or just when it's convenient? Do we resemble the people of Micah's day in any ways? As a believer in Jesus Christ, you may be the only Christian, the only believer a person encounters. How can we humble ourselves in every circumstance so that we represent him for who he is? A prayer we can whisper to the Lord regularly is, less of me and more of you, Lord hoping that we show Jesus to those we encounter. Our belief in Jesus's return, the hope of a Messiah, it causes us to realize that today, this world is not all there is. And we begin to live for others, no longer worrying about vengeance or our offended hearts, because we trust that God's gonna take care of all of that. He'll take care of it in his perfect timing. And that frees us up. It frees us up to have his goals become our goals. Then what breaks his heart will break our heart as well. Because his kingdom and his purpose will matter more than our own. And the love we have for him, it'll shine brightly to those around us. I think we all know that if that's what we brought, it would be noticed. The second coming of Christ is good news. And that is our final principle. Jesus's rule will bring a just society. Jesus's rule will bring a just society. When Jesus returns, believers will be part of this new kingdom, but we're not there yet. In the meantime, God has called his people, you and me, to be salt and light to the world, to show his hands, his feet, and his heart wherever we go. He's called us to show the world a better way, marked by justice and mercy that's done in humility, done for him in his name. 
We serve an all-knowing God that is fully aware of what's happening in our world today. He is fully aware of the fallenness of this world. It doesn't surprise him, but it won't stop his plan. He will return to deliver those who believe in him and repent. In seven, chapter 7, verse 7, Micah proclaims this beautiful statement. But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. So when Christ returns, may we be found fully faithful, like Micah, showing our love for him and living out our faith in him. Pray with me, please. Lord, you are good. You are so good. And you come with such amazing promises that our world will never be able to offer or be true to. I pray that each heart here, including my own, will surrender open hands to you, Lord, to let you have your way that we would be open to your truths, surrender our own agenda and trade it in because it is small potatoes to what you offer, that we would run full heartedly after you in all that we do. In your name we pray, amen. amen.